Hello, my name is Anne Hermann, and I'm teaching at the Center for Buddhist Studies at Ghent University in Belgium. Today, I would like to ask you a question. Namely, can early Buddhist discipline texts be a valid source for material culture? Or, can they tell us anything on the daily life of monks and nuns and on the objects used by them? Let me first introduce what I mean by material culture. And for this, I'm referring to a definition given by John Kishnick in the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Emotion. Material culture is generally defined as artifacts, as well as ideas about and context related to artifacts, with artifacts limited to material objects made or altered by human beings. So it's not only about artifacts or objects, but also about ideas and conduct related to these objects. So, can disciplinary texts help us to understand material culture? Disciplinary texts are normative texts, in early Buddhism also called Vinaya texts. They provide guidelines and rules for members of the monastic community, particularly for monks and nuns. Early Buddhist normative texts are written in India, and with the spread of Buddhism, commented upon in other parts of the world. They contain overwhelming amount of information on artifacts and on ideas and practices related to artifacts. So yes, they are, or they seem to be, very valid sources for the study of material culture. Objects and practices they mention can tell us a great deal about the values of monastic life, taking into account time and space. Discipline texts provide details on ideal and normative life, but can they tell us anything on real life, on real monastic life? My answer will be yes, as we will see soon. And for this, I have three main reasons. First of all, as I argued together with Matthieu Torque in a book on the pure mind and the clean body, objects and practices mentioned in texts were at least imaginable, and must have been known to Buddhist followers who wrote and read the discipline text or heard them recited. If authors and readers do not understand each other, the texts make no sense. Secondly, as aptly pointed out by Jane Nature in a book on the Bodhisattva part, when incidental mention is made of items unrelated to the author's primary agenda, we have a situation in which we may draw, with some confidence, on data found within a normative text. So, information provided on an object is more trustworthy when the object is not part of the central message, but is just mentioned incidentally. For instance, when we have a very brief reference to a mosquito net in a chapter on wealth in the possession of monks, we know that monks have a mosquito net. And from this small information, we can expand our knowledge on devices used to protect oneself against these annoying animals. Thirdly, one can try, as much as possible, to corroborate one's own findings by other sources, such as non-Buddhist texts, paintings, also mural paintings, and archaeological findings. Let me give you a few examples on toilets, on shaving tools, on clothes and shoes. First, toilets. A study of normative text shows a growing emphasis on a pure mind in a clean body. So from a simple pigsty toilet, we move to a complex room with separate doors, incense pots and tools for washing, as you see on this drawing of the latrine of the Jingshan Monastery of the 13th century. At the top, you see the individual toilets, each with an own door. In front of the door stands an incense pot. At the other side of the room, we see a lot of tools used for washing. Tools can also be markers of identity. For instance, when shaving the beard and shaving the hair. One uses knives, no scissors, as instructed by the Vinaya text. Also clothes and shoes are markers of identity. Here we see different kinds of clothes on a mural of the 8th century 
at the Uhlenkave in Tuenhuang. We also noticed on the left beautifully decorated shoes with raised tips. The lady, who is a candidate for ordination, will leave these shoes behind her and she will change to shoes that are very simple as you see on the right hand side. But we should be very careful. Text and images do not always match. Vinaya texts tell us that monks should have very short nails. But on this drawing made at the end of the 19th century, we see the famous Vinaya master Tao Xuan with extremely long nails, probably a sign of nobility at the end of the 19th century. So to conclude, yes, discipline texts do offer a fascinating view on material culture when properly contextualized. If you're interested or you have more questions, do not hesitate to contact me at the Center for Buddhist Studies at Kent University.